Northeast and Columbia, I've got an FEA sample 7 status for you. Okay, we're ready to copy. Okay, Tammy, uh, terminations number one and number two are complete on that. We ran it last night while Dan was running on the treadmill. We had a heater translation start time of six days, seven hours, and 40 minutes. Uh, we ran it the entire time that Dan was running, uh, had the hiss on for 40 minutes. The heater power um, while we were translating was about 44 watts. And the molten zone uh, was, I'm just guessing now, uh, about, say, 5 sixteenths of an inch in front of the heater element and a little bit greater than an inch behind the heater element. And I guess as in the past um, ones that we've seen up here, um, striations on the sample itself, and you could tell the molten zone actually by the undulating while Dan was uh, running on the treadmill. It's pretty dramatic. Dave, we copy. Thanks. Columbia Houston, Columbia, we have Houston. a nice view of the nice Terminator, view of here, on the Terminator here on the ground. But we know our view is quite as nice as yours. Nice as yours. Roger that. Roger that.
Boston, Columbia. Go ahead, Dan. You ready for Donnelly? You bet. How's that look? Dan, that looks great. Okay, uh, what we have today is uh, G. David and uh, Bonnie and uh, Marsha are down in the mid-deck working on uh, LBNP. And what I'm going to do is uh, pass you off to uh, David and let him uh, tell you about uh, all the equipment and uh, what they're doing. Okay, Houston, what, we, uh, what you can see here is the lower body negative pressure device, um, or LBNP as we've been calling it here. Um, what this is is a candidate reconditioning protocol that uh, we hope might be able to use for uh, overcoming or, or bettering orthostatic intolerance. Orthostatic intolerance in, in one gravity is the um, inability to stand up without feeling dizzy or lightheaded or even in the worst case um, passing out or, or um, fainting. Um, one thing that we've seen in virtually 100% of American astronauts on their return from space flight is a decrease in their orthostatic tolerance. And so far with our um, with the short duration space flights that we've had, we have not seen uh, any adverse effects from that. In fact, we've got a current protocol on the shuttle flights of about an hour before re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. We ingest about 32 fluid ounces of water and take about eight salt tablets um, as a, a countermeasure for the decrease in orthostatic tolerance that we've seen. However, ground-based studies, these are bed rest studies where we put people in devices like this for um, weeks at a time, uh, these ground-based studies have shown that um, a combination of using lower body negative pressure as well as the fluid loading and, um, with the salt tablets works even better at uh, decreasing your, uh, your orthostatic intolerance. And Houston, if you pardon me, we're gonna, we actually are doing some work right here, so we're going to be working and talking uh, simul here. Okay, so what we've got here is uh, the lower body negative pressure device. The last time uh, we flew one of these in the U.S. space program was uh, on a Skylab mission. In fact, we flew it uh, on all three of the Skylab missions. It looked a little bit different from this. In fact, it was a, uh, a solid can um, that we flew. In this case, this entire device and all the equipment that you see right here can be folded up and, and put into one of our lockers here. What we're doing here is um, at at uh, the same time that, that Bonnie has a lower body, uh, a lower pressure on her uh, lower body right now, Marcia is um, using the American flight echocardiograph and taking some pictures of her heart. Now the measurements that we take while we're doing this, um, we are constantly measuring uh, blood pressure, heart rate, and EKG. Um, and in fact, uh, EKG and heart rate are being constantly downlinked to the ground. Blood pressure is the only one, uh, up here we're the only ones that have the, the blood pressure. We're monitoring that on this automatic blood pressure device, and it's also being taped down here on a recorder. Now, uh, the device that you, you see here in front of us, actually, uh, the, the team that, that designed this and put this together is headed up by Dr. John Charles. He's the principal investigator. And uh, the folks that are working with him, Bonnie and I have, and, and Marcia, have worked uh, for the last four or five months very closely with them. And I think they've done a super job with the hardware here and also the procedures. So everything is working very, very smoothly.
we're doing here, uh, the way we uh, draw a lower pressure or a negative pressure on uh, inside this can, you can see this hose right here. This is actually connected up through our waste collection system, the WCS, and it's actually venting overboard. And we use that to draw a, a negative pressure on uh, the lower portion of, of Bonnie's body here. She's got a, a seal that you can see right here that's uh, made out of a, a wetsuit material, and that actually seals it up here. What we're doing is we're, um, we've got two different protocols that we run. Yesterday, we, Bonnie and I both ran what's called a ramped protocol, and today Bonnie's in what's called the soak protocol, and I think I'm going to do that two days from now. In the ramped protocol, what we do is we take the pressure in the lower portion of the, the body here down to minus 10 millimeters of mercury for three minutes. And then in steps of three minutes each, we go to minus 20 millimeters, minus 30 millimeters, minus 40 millimeters, and then to uh, down to minus 50 millimeters of mercury. Minus 50 millimeters of mercury is the equivalent stress on the heart um, of standing up in 1G. And what we've been doing in the, in the ramp protocol is we go to minus 50, um, stay there for three minutes, and then, and then we come back uh, down to, to uh, the normal cabin pressure in, inside the, the can. During the soak protocol, which is what uh, Bonnie is in right now, this is actually a four-hour protocol. Those ramp protocols, if you just add up all the numbers plus a control, a 10-minute control at the beginning, that lasts maybe uh, 40 minutes total. Um, this soak protocol is lasting about four hours today, um, in which Bonnie went through the normal ramp up or down to 50 millimeters of mercury uh, pressure. And then we brought that back to about minus 30 millimeters of mercury, and that's where she is sitting right now, at minus 30 millimeters of mercury, which, again, um, is the equivalent stress on the heart of about 0.6 Gs um, if you're standing up down, down on Earth. And we're having Bonnie stay like this for about uh, um, four hours today. And then at the end of this protocol, we're going to ramp back up to 40 millimeters, or excuse me, back down to 40 millimeters of mercury, back down to 50 millimeters of mercury, each of those for two three minutes and then we'll come back down to uh, or back up to um, the normal cabin pressure inside the bag there. During the first hour of this, Bonnie ingested uh, 32 ounces of uh, it actually lemonade with uh, artificial sweetener and she took eight salt tablets. So we're essentially doing the same fluid loading protocol that we do um, in the shuttle and uh, along with the, uh, the lower body negative pressure and again we'll be able to compare this with um, various ground-based bed rest studies that have been done. Um, right now we've only got, we, it, when we come out of this mission, we are only going to have uh, two data points, which really isn't enough to draw any conclusions from, but um, we'll be able to measure Bonnie's and my heart rate, blood pressure, and EKG when we return uh, to Edwards in a few days um, and see if uh, we think there was any effect from this. But more importantly, when we fly this on some more shuttle flights and also, uh, you know, if you have any iterations, that any suggestions that we might be able to make to this, iterations between this and, and the ground-based studies, uh, um, hopefully uh, in the future we'll be able to come up with a, a, a fairly good uh, or maybe uh, even a more effective countermeasure to orthostatic intolerance. Um, let me just, uh, I guess I can point out a little bit more about some of the equipment here. We've got a, an, an automatic blood pressure cuff, which is right here, and in fact that will inflate every 15 minutes during the soak period, um, and we get an automatic readout right here. We've got a, uh, a backup, uh, a manual blood pressure cuff, because the blood pressure readings are so important uh, in case something were to ever happen to that one, we can just take a manual reading right here, and that's all ready to go. In fact, these things have worked flawlessly. It's, uh, it's been great. We've got the uh, pressure regulator right here w that we try to maintain right now at, uh, at uh, about 30. Right now, in fact, it's at reading 20, uh, 28, so we need to increase it a little bit. And we've got a vacuum regulator here and a data recorder right down there. Inside this device, Bonnie's feet are not touching the, uh, the bottom. She's actually sitting on uh, a, what looks like a very padded... Um, bicycle seat, and in fact that's her sole means of support right now. As you begin to draw pressure, um, or, or negative pressure, in, inside this can here, um, Bonnie feels more and more uh, pressure contact between herself and, and the seat. And what we've got right here, this little green knob, is sort of a, a dump valve. If at any time uh, she felt like it, she uh, could just turn that knob and it would dump all the pressure out of there immediately.
Uh, Houston, that's uh, probably about all that we've got right here. Uh, we've got about another hour and 15 minutes of soak time on Bonnie before we go back up to the uh, to the, the next ramp phase, and that ramp phase uh, going from 40 to 50 back down to zero is only going to take us another 12 minutes or so. All right, uh, just checking with Bonnie. Uh, tomorrow what we'll be doing is I'll be, we'll be switching positions here. I'll be inside the can, and, uh, and Bonnie will be essentially the, uh, the operator of the equipment on the outside, and I'll be going through a four-hour soak. Um, I think before we even do that, Bonnie's going to come back one more time and do a, uh, a, a quick 40-minute ramp from uh, zero up to uh, or down to 50 millimeters of mercury. And again, during uh, that whole time, Marshall will be back over here um, doing some uh, echocardiographs on us. During the ramps, we have echocardiographs continuously during these soaks. Uh, Marshall only has to come down here once an hour, and we, and we take some data at that time. And then finally, on uh, flight day 10, I guess we both uh, do, uh, in fact, I think I have one more ramp. Bonnie doesn't have any ramp at all. And that'll be the last one before we come home. Dave, we copy all that. Um, we appreciate the brief on LBNP. Y'all look great up there. All right, Jamie, thanks. Columbia Houston. Columbia Houston, we're ready for CCTV. Okay, Houston, here it comes. Morning, Houston, and uh, it's a pleasure to bring you back aboard Columbia again. Uh, what we'd like to do today is uh, give you a demonstration of uh, some of the equipment we have on board the shuttle. I know you're all uh, very aware of the many pictures uh, that uh, people see coming down from the shuttle in real time and also the photographs uh, that are brought back. Uh, the photo documentation on board these shuttle missions uh, is done with a variety of photographic equipment. And the purpose of the uh, documentation is uh, for uh, Earth observations, for technical documentation of various experiments and payloads, and some of it uh, is just pure aesthetics uh, to demonstrate and show people uh, of America that support our space program how beautiful uh, this uh, universe is that we live on. So with uh, that uh, in mind, I'd like to introduce uh, Marsha Ivins, who's going to uh, show you uh, and demonstrate some of the things we do with the 70 millimeter camera. And here's Marsha. The uh, 70 millimeter camera that we use for mostly Earth observations is a Hasselblad. It's a standard Hasselblad that's pretty much not modified for our use. It has a motor drive on it, and it has a data magazine. The data mag holds about 95 or 100 frames of film, and it has a, uh, a uh, data on the back that basically tells us the MET of what we're shooting. For some film tests that we're flying, I have some regular rolls of 120 film, which is what a Hasselblad normally uses, and I have the, uh, the uh, little backs for that so that I can compare this to other types of film. 
In order to do that, I use this device, which has got two cameras on the same, two cameras on one bracket, and they are connected to a button. When I hit one button, I fire both cameras at the same time. We fly three different lenses on this camera, a 50, a 100, and a 250, and in this case, I have two 250s. I can line this up. The scenes compare two films and compare two speeds, compare two different f-stops. One of the things we're doing on this flight is to look at long lenses, and so I have yet even a bigger lens. This is a 500 millimeter lens for the Hasselblad, and we'll be comparing this to a long lens for the, the uh, 35 millimeter camera also, and seeing how well we do looking at that. This camera is not an automatic camera. It requires that you determine what your own exposure is, and so our spot gives us an exposure, but we also use a spot meter looking out the window to average the scene and uh, decide what exposure to use. That's about it for the 70. The 35 will be Weatherby. This is a standard 35 millimeter camera uh, that most folks have at home. We use it here on board the shuttle for documenting crew actions and taking still photography of some of the uh, mid-deck experiments that we're accomplishing and also some uh, action out in the payload bay or, uh, for example, LDAF in our case and, uh, and Earth observation photography. We use on this camera various uh, different lenses ranging all the way from Uh, fisheye lens uh, for documenting action in the in the mid deck uh, when you need to have a, a wide field of view and, and it's the standard uh, photograph that you see that's slightly distorted out on the side. Uh, one of our favorites, uh, 3570 zoom for taking uh, Earth observations. You can frame the picture uh, pretty nicely with that. and all the way up to my favorite, the 300 millimeter lens. We're uh, using uh, this lens to compare it with the uh, 70 millimeter photography that Marsha is taking. Some of the features on, on this camera, of course, the standard uh, flash that we use. Uh, it has an automatic feature so you don't have to worry about any times or setting the lights or, or taking meter readings down in the mid-deck. It's automatic and you just uh, view it and shoot. We have a data back on the, on the back of the camera that automatically prints the MET on the, on the photograph, uh, useful for Earth observation so we can locate uh, the, the picture that we've taken. And of course, my favorite, the motor drive. You just point, shoot, and it rewinds and you're ready for the next shot. Dave is next and he'll be talking about the Airy camera. What we've got here is a 16 millimeter Aeroflex motion picture camera. Um, this is actually an identical camera to a camera that's used widely in the motion picture industry. On uh, board, we use it to document uh, almost all the activities that we do here. In fact, most of the uh, films that we take when we go talking uh, throughout the country about our space flights are taken with this camera here. What, uh, we've got two different kinds of lenses here. What we've got on here right now is the uh, a 10 to 100 millimeter lens. Uh, the nice thing about this is that it's also got an, an auto feature to it that will take care of your f-stops for you. So all you have to do is uh, point, focus, and then shoot. The camera is battery powered, and this is the battery pack right here. It's got uh, 16 millimeter magazines right here. We carry about 12 of these on board with us, and it can be these magazines can be daylight loaded. So the camera itself is just this portion here that you're seeing. And with that, uh, I think Bonnie Dunbar is going to talk about the CCTV system that we have on board.
I'm going to talk a little bit about our video systems, or what we call our cir closed circuit TV. We have both interior and exterior cameras. Most of the video that came down during the rendezvous and capture of LDAP was exterior video. The payload bay is a rectangle, and at each corner there is a, a camera. Normally we can carry both color and black and white and wide angle and standard view lenses. I'm going to take a, a moment here and show you some of them. I'm going to downlink first uh, what we call camera D, which is in the forward right side of the uh, shuttle payload bay, and it's looking at the aft side of the shuttle, LDEF, uh, over at the right-hand side. And if you look closely, you can see uh, camera C down there on the aft bulkhead. Going back over to camera A, which is on the forward left or port side of the uh, vehicle, you can uh, maybe make out camera B, or Bravo, down at the aft bulkhead, but you also see the remote manipulator system off to your right. We use this to capture the LDF, and it also has two camera systems on it. It has a camera on the elbow, which is a color-wide angle lens, and then it has a camera right where the uh, arm grapples onto the payload, which is called the end effector. And we use that camera on board to actually fly the end effector like an airplane. Our controllers on board have uh, roll pitch and yaw and translation axes, and we look at a TV monitor inside. Coming back inside, you can see the uh, two TV monitors that we use. And during the uh, grapple of LDAP, I couldn't see very well out the windows exactly what I was grappling onto. In fact, I was using primarily these TV monitors to look at what I had to do. Uh, we control all of the shuttle clo closed circuitry TV from this panel right here, where we can select the television uh, camera that we want to use and where we want it to go. We can also power it on and off. Uh, recently, on several shuttle flights, we have been evaluating uh, off-the-shelf uh, camcorders, and we have one here, several different models. We found these uh, very useful for in-cabin photography and for uh, experimental documentation. In fact, they've been so successful that we have at least two experiments on this flight that utilize uh, off-the-shelf camcorders uh, in, and macro lenses for documenting experimental results. Well, this gives you kind of a quick view of the video systems that we have on board, and uh, we'd definitely like to thank all the people who uh, helped support us in doing this. And now I'll get you back to Dan. Well, the last camera system we have on board is probably the, the granddaddy of all cameras, and uh, it uh, should be coming into the view right here. And that's a very large format camera. It's uh, called IMAX. Uh, it's uh, actually a payload. Uh, it flies on uh, specific uh, shuttle missions and has uh, documented The Dream is Alive as one of the movies. It's shown in uh, several uh, theaters. I think there are about 100 theaters worldwide, uh, very special theaters that uh, only show this format. The uh, the format of each frame is 70 millimeters uh, high by 120 long, and it gives a very high fidelity picture. As you can see, it's a, a very large camera, and uh, it's not uh, something you, you use uh, at the spur of the moment. You pretty well have to plan your shots ahead of time. As you can see, I'm holding it by some hand holes, which allow you to maneuver it like that. And we also, uh, to get the best shots that are most stabilized, we have a, a rig where we can mount it at the window right over here and it takes a shot looking right at the earth. So using it this way it's uh, very stabilized and uh, we get uh, some very good pictures. Uh, all in all, as you can see, we have a, a wide variety of uh, cameras on board. A couple things I think uh, worth noting uh, that uh, Marsha alluded to in the 70 millimeter that we were running some tests. Uh, we've uh, normally uh, used only one or two types of film, and on this uh, flight we have a great number of films that we're doing the side-by-side -side comparison, hopefully uh, to enhance uh, the uh, phot photography and uh, get better pictures uh, in the future. Well, once again, these uh, photographs are used for a wide variety of things. Uh, for instance, on the LDF retrieve to document uh, the various uh, experiments before uh, it even re-enters uh, in the shuttle, and, uh, gets maybe bounced around a little bit when we uh, land, 
It, uh, Marsha took over 70, 700 photographs uh, with the 70 millimeter to document each individual tray on the LDAP. So quite a bit of technical data are uh, collected on the, the, the photographs and the uh, tapes and the uh, movies we take. In addition to the uh, other uh, around the life on the shuttle as we're doing right now. And uh, with that, uh, hopefully this will uh, lend a little insight into some of the equipment we have on board the shuttle. And we'd like to turn the cameras back to the ground who also can control the TV cameras. And uh, they can uh, look at some Earth uh, views. Thanks a lot. Dan, thank you for an informative presentation. Columbia, Houston. Uh, we currently have a nice view out the payload bay. Your Orbit One team has enjoyed working with you once again, and we'll see you tomorrow. Handing over to Orbit Two and Steve Oswald. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, and uh, we'll see you again tomorrow. Columbia. Go ahead, Columbia. Hello, Steve. I guess we'll maneuver back to our world famous uh, 2390 attitude that we've been flying. If that's what you'd like. Columbia, that sounds good to us. Columbia, Houston, we're configuring for the PMC down here. Just give us a call when you're ready to start that. Columbia, Rabani, we're configured in uh, PMC on your call.
Okay, Dan, uh, talking this over with ACOM, uh, basically we think it's uh, be just fine if you go ahead and set up the wand uh, for removing the free water. You can use the uh, free fluid disposal procedures on page W12 of the IFM checklist. Our concern was that we did not want you to use the uh, HUMSEP contingency uh, water removal procedures that we sent you in uh, message 33 Charlie because there's some concern about flooding the WCS and we weren't sure whether or not uh, you were thinking about using those procedures. Uh, using the free water dis free fluid disposal procedures because of uh, contamination concerns with LDEF we'd like you to limit uh, using those procedures when you're uh, to when you're in dump attitude either in the morning or the evening uh, for supply water dumps. Okay, that sounds reasonable. We'll have it all set up, ready to go when we start to dump tonight and uh, do it in conjunction with that. Maybe after I called you, I thought about, about that, that uh, there might be a concern with the contamination that I hadn't considered, so it was a, appreciate the heads up. Thanks. Sure thing, and uh, and we were thinking, uh, I don't know whether it's possible, but if you can, uh, we're thinking it probably would be good for you if you just go ahead and leave the towel setup that you've got in there uh, rather than replacing it each time, but that's certainly your call. Uh, but if you can squeeze some of the water out of that towel as you're doing it, uh, that may, uh, may help you and, and last from uh, one water dump to the next without getting any more free fluid down in the, in the bilges. Yeah, we'll take a look at it. That, that was kind of my hope to be able to leave the towel in there and just, uh, you know, suck out the water that's kind of pooled in there, and uh, we'll see how that works. Okay, Dan, I understand. I think we're all uh, reading from the same sheet of music.